Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to Central Park. My name is Ryan, and I'm the guide for the Central Park Conservancy. And here at the Central Park Conservancy, we're happy to continue bringing the park to you through our virtual programs, like our weekly walks, which you're joining us for today. Welcome. Today, we're going to be taking a weekly walk titled Winter Lawn Care here in Central Park with me, Ryan, on today, March 1st, 2023. Thanks again for continuing to support us here at the Central Park Conservancy through these programs. Today, we're going to be taking a weekly walk, and just about all the photos you're going to see were taken by myself here in the park over the past few weeks, or rather over the past week, just a couple of days ago, actually. Um, thank, you, uh, thank you again for the support here at the Central Park Conservancy. We're, of course, the nonprofit private organization who cares for Central Park. Our mission being to preserve and celebrate Central Park as a sanctuary from the peace and pressures of city life, enhancing the enjoyment and well being of all. As we make our way through the park today, I want to encourage you to engage in our little walk today using the chat feature to maybe share a favorite memory that you had on lawns, excuse me, on lawns here in the park, or ask a question using the QA feature. My colleagues Jose and Desiree will be on the back end answering any questions you might have. The last thing you'll see pop up are going to be some visitor polls that I'll share throughout the walk today. Uh, after everybody has voted in those, I can share the results so we can see what everybody's been thinking. Last thing you will see popping up in just a moment are going to be the transcripts that are going to be coming up. Those live transcripts or captions, you do have the option to turn them off. Uh, just using that CC icon or live transcript um, icon on the Zoom toolbar. But otherwise, we'll be making our way through the park on this little route today as we discuss winter lawn care. Now, lawns might not seem like the most interesting topic, but they play a very vital role in Central Park. In fact, when Central Park was designed in the 19th century, the winning design for this park was titled the Greensward Plan, which literally means grass-covered grounds. So on our walk today, we'll talk a little bit about the history of lawns here in Central Park and largely focus on the care that our Central Park Conservancy staff provides these lawns, especially getting them ready for winter, where they'll heavily be used in the following spring and summer months for our recreation and enjoyment. So we're gonna begin our walk on West 100th Street, just along Central Park West, as we make our way into the park and talk a little bit about these historic landscapes found within Central Park's 843 acres. Now, as we enter the park, we're entering just a few days ago. So a little bit before that snow that came just the other night graced the park with a little bit of beautiful white covering. But as we enter the park, it is looking like it's about to snow in these photos. As we enter the park, actually just after the half marathon that occurred this past Sunday. And as we enter the park, we can see some runners finishing up wrapped up in their blankets because it is a little chilly out there. Luckily, that cold weather did bring on some snow, but just a few days before that snow, we can enjoy our walk through the park as we come through a typical overcast winter day and make our way a little bit towards one of the largest lawns that we'll find in Central Park. But before we make our way to those lawns, we can notice something that we don't see too often in the park, a bench, but specifically a bench that does not have a plaque on it. As you may know, benches in the park, all about 8,063 or so of them, can be adopted. And adopting a bench is a great way to support the park, which will also get you a little plaque with maybe your name or a fun little saying on it. Reading over the little um, messages left behind by people that have adopted benches is a great way to add a little bit of extra kind of um, poetry to your walk throughout the park. And you'll find a lot of unclaimed benches in the northern section of Central Park. So if you ever had your eye on a bench, keep an eye in the northern end. You might just find one that really catches your fancy. But as we make our way through the park, we'll turn our eyes to the main subject of today's walk, grass. Again, grass might not seem too exciting, but there are a lot of interesting tidbits about grass. Uh, for example, grass is the most common plant you'll find in the entire world. Many, many different species of grass exist. And I think the most common grass we tend to think of are the grass that we use for turf or for lawns. And we'll talk a little bit about what types of grass we might use here in Central Park. But let's make our way past some of these bushier, uh, more decorative patches of grass and make our way to some more open lawns. As we head just a little bit south into the park briefly, we can enjoy some of the various different uses these landscapes provide. Looking just over to our left, we can see even in this winter season, lawns providing a lot of fun to various people, like these kids having a little catch with a frisbee over here. Now, the idea of lawns, or what we consider a lawn, being these very grassy areas, kind of developed between the 16th and 17th century over in Europe. 
Uh, they were very common on wealthier families' properties. And we tend to see these kind of um, initially really instituting more of a kind of wealth status as they would often be large acred landscapes that maybe have sheep or other types of animals grazing upon them. It was very fitting in Europe where the climate is pretty moist and mild. But over here in North America, lawns aren't that fitting and they can be a little bit harder to maintain in this temperate climate. Um, also more challenging as the effects of climate change really take a hold. But we can think also about the different types of uses of landscapes. We see, of course, lawns being great used, uh, great landscapes to use for picnicking as well as recreation. And lawns, of course, were really vital to the initial design of Central Park. As we can see in this photo from 1904, showing the boys or children's play area in Central Park. This used to be um, where today's present Hector ball fields exist today. And lawns like this were used for a combination of features from recreation to, of course, just pastoral enjoyment. And you'll notice that different lawns have different uses throughout the park. The lawns that we might engage in recreation upon, like Hector ball fields, are very different than the ones we might just leisurely lay upon, like sheep meadow. So we can see different lawns really providing different uses. As we make our way a little bit further into the park, we'll touch more on some lawns, but for now we'll enjoy the walk, taking a uh, lesser traveled path in the park, not really seeing too many people as we make our way through the park on this Sunday afternoon. As the weather has gotten a little bit colder, we do see a little bit of a drop off, but the past few months have been extremely busy here in Central Park because the very mild winter has felt kind of more like an October or fall day rather than a January or February day. So as we start to make our way through the park, we can notice a little bit of a drop off as things start to chill up just a little bit. And as we make our way further to the east, we can head to the North Meadow Recreation Center. But before we get over there, we can talk a little bit about some of the different types of grass that we might use on landscapes uh, all throughout the park. Again, lawns are used for different things, and that means the grass used on them might vary. Some grasses, for example, they primarily grow in the spring and early summer, while others come more towards the dead, uh, more grow a lot rather more towards the midsummer and points of high sun and high heat. So different species of grass can be used in various landscapes, depending what they're used for. Of course, landscapes like sheep meadow, we do close them off during the winter unless we get at least six inches of snow to help restore that grass and keep it ready for summer. But other smaller landscapes on the side might regularly be open during this time to allow people to maybe walk their dogs or potentially even go sledding if the conditions allow for it. On that subject, actually, I'd like to launch a poll and just ask you what your favorite activity to do on lawns is. So let everybody vote in that a little bit. And what you'll notice is, again, different types of grass and different landscapes. Here in Central Park, we use a wide array of different grass species. But to name a few, we'll use species like a few different fennel species. We'll use a couple different bluegrass species, some fescue, and even some ryegrass, just to name a couple. Again, these grasses might depend on the actual lawn or landscape where they're being planted. But as we make our way a little bit further into the park, we'll talk about some of the really principles that go into caring for these lawns. Again, some of these lawns tend to brown out during the winter season, as is natural for those species of grass, while others remain kind of lonely, lush, and green. But let's make our way a little bit further into the park and discuss really how we care for these lands. Of course, we do decide a lot of the species of grass depending on where the landscape is. And some of the areas where we're walking right now where this little walking icon are, are a little bit more shaded. So we tend to put more shade tolerant grass there. Whereas we might put uh, more um, drought resistant uh, types of grass in open meadows that experience a lot of sun and high heat with little shade. So just thinking about where the lawn is can actually determine what type of grass is gonna be there. But before we continue talking a little bit about grass, let's talk about this area just up in the midsection of the park over here, the North Meadow Recreation Center. This area isn't that visited amongst the visitor centers we at the Central Park Conservancy operate. That is, unless you're coming up here to engage in recreation. Best known for its ball fields, uh, this, or rather its basketball courts probably, this is a great spot for youth basketball clinics. And this center is pretty interesting. It used to at one point actually be um, operating as a stable, 
This building being created in the early 20th century would go through a few updates, but eventually it would become a stable and later it become a more advanced recreation center as of course needs and uses for the park would change. But looking at the top, we can see that little, um, I don't know the proper term, but that little wind direction turret that has an appropriate equestrian uh, uh, figure up top to help us remember the, of course, horsey history of this landscape. Um, as we move a little bit further beyond though, we can see what's probably best known for North Meadow today, the handball courts in the back, which have become a favorite for pickleball users. And as we eventually see this area receiving some restoration, by us here at the Central Park Conservancy, we will see the addition of pick pickleball courts being added in here. Of course, the park certainly responds to the uses that um, people use it for. And of course, overwhelming amount of support for pickleball has poured out over the years, leading to upgrades occurring eventually throughout parks like Central Park. But we're not here to talk about pickleball, we're here to talk about grass. And the reason we stop by here is because just like the yard, another one of our operational centers at the Central Park Conservancy. The North Meadow area serves as one of the central hubs for our operations staff who care for landscapes like lawns. And of course, as we make our way around this area, we're bordering North Meadow, one of the largest collections of not only ball fields, but open turf and grass that we can find here. In Central Park. Of course, it is closed for the season, unless six inches of snow or more are added to this field. And it doesn't look like we're gonna get there just yet, but this will be opening up back up, uh, will be opening back up in the springtime once weather allows. But for now, we can talk a little bit about how these vast landscapes are managed and cared for. One of the first things that go into caring for these landscapes, something we all might know, something we also might not love, which is raking. Uh, believe it or not, winter is a great time to finish or if you didn't even start begin your raking for the year. Um, really cleaning up these leaves is very helpful because it'll actually help prevent different types of fungal growth and other types of infestation that might occur. We can also see things like impaction of the soil and the grass from heavy concentrations of leaves, especially as they get wet, which can also lead to drainage problems and even coloration problems in the grass. So while it might not be the funnest or excite, most exciting activity, and also a little dreadful for, uh, depending how big your lawn is, raking and removing debris is gonna be a very important feature for caring for lawns. Of course, another feature that we might know pretty well is mowing the lawns. We certainly have a lot of work to do to mow all of Central Park's uh, lawn space. A lot of different acreage and various landscapes ranging from Sheep Meadow to the Great Lawn to North Meadow and plenty other smaller little lawnscapes in between. Um, you can actually still mow your lawn in the winter, even if you didn't get to it uh, early enough in the fall, similarly with raking. You do actually surprisingly want your grass to be a little bit shorter in the winter time than you do in the summer. And this is again to help with things like infestation, inhibit different types of rodents and voles and things like that that might really chew up and mess up the lawn, as well as to uh, reduce really the overall amount of snow mold that might form. Again, luckily we don't have too much snow or maybe not so luckily, we don't have too much snow to deal with this winter season. So snow mold probably won't be a problem. Of course, mowing the lawns uh, takes a lot of staff and a lot of work and ranges in the type of equipment used from push mowers to weed whackers to of course much larger vehicles to of course much larger types of mowing vehicles like we can see here. Uh, anybody have any guesses as to where uh, or what park this is? You might be saying Central Park, but actually it is not. While we do see Central Park Conservancy staff mowing here, the photo you're actually seeing is from St. Nicholas Park. St. Nicholas Park is one of the historic Harlem Park chains. And you might be surprised to find out that we at the Central Park Conservancy actually help to care for countless other parks beyond Central Park. We actually have Harlem Parks team that's part of our five borough crew. This five borough crew cares for countless parks besides just Central Park. Uh, her, star, uh, her historic Harlem Parks team, for example, they actually care for Jackie Robinson Park, Morningside Park, Marcus Garvey Park and St. Nicholas Park, as we can see here, assisting the parks department in care of the landscapes beyond just the grass, but also the physical infrastructure of these areas. Um, something that I'm sure a lot of people aren't familiar with. 
Actually, on that subject, if you'd ever like us to do a weekly walk or a future program covering some of the work we do in parks beyond just Central Park, let us know in the chat. Drop a line if you'd like us to cover or do a program talking about the work we do in parks beyond Central Park. But as we snap back to our current time, we can check out some fencing here, something that helps to not only keep people off the grass when we're mowing, but also keep the park looking healthy, clean, and green. Before we talk about the use for fences, I'll just share that poll that we have over there. And it looks like a lot of people like to rest and relax on the lawns. Um, I myself have had some wonderful little naps on some of Central Park's land, uh, lawns, whether it be by choice or maybe I just got too comfortable and woke up a little bit later. But of course, another one of my favorites I see is another popular answer, attending a concert. I have been to quite a few concerts on the Great Lawn and other various little landscapes throughout the park. And of course, standing on something a little bit more natural like grass is such an incredible feeling compared to the traditional hard surface we uh, encounter for most concerts and shows. But of course, plenty of great options there. As always, if you put other, I'd love to hear what your other option is, if you wouldn't mind writing that in the chat for me. But as we continue back to our uh, current Central Park photo, we can see the fencing that is found up here, which plays a crucial role in helping to, of course, protect the lawns, keeping people off when the lawns are closed or when we're mowing, and also helping to channel entrances and exits onto the lawn. One of the main issues that we really have to watch out for with lawns all throughout New York City and just in general is minimizing compaction. Soil compaction can lead to of course, a lot of dead landscapes, as well as desire lines, something we can see an example of here. Desire lines are something I'm sure we've all seen. Uh, for example, this area, instead of walking around the path, cutting over the lawn provides a little bit of a shortcut. But after constant traffic passes over this area, you can imagine Central Park seeing 42 million visits a year, a lot of feet walking over this path compressing the soil and preventing any type of plant growth there. This is something that does require some extended restoration to help bring this landscape back. And if we didn't have some of those fences surrounding lawns throughout the park, we probably would have desire lines like this uh, in a lot of different areas beyond just the few that we can experience throughout the park today. But of course, minimizing compaction is very, very important. We do see desire lines forming on a lot of areas, but having controlled exits and entrances will help reduce the impact of where these are found, allowing us to, of course, eventually restore them, closing off that entrance or exit and switching it to a different one. But beyond just, of course, people walking, we also worry about things like the just general weight and compaction of snow, for example. Um, snow piled on top of grass can cause compaction and even bare spots to form. We uh, are very careful and very conscious about when we're even putting snow from paths onto lawns. If you can, we try to avoid shoveling snow directly onto the borders or sides of lawns because that compressed weight and even eventual melt can actually kill the lawn. So by spreading snow out more evenly, as well as we spread out traffic of people walking through the park, we can actually accelerate the melting of snow and we can inhibit mold formation crown damage, and brown spots from forming on here. Of course, uh, not too much snow and too much weight that we have to avoid today. But as we walk through the park, we do have, of course, some other issues to deal with, like the low soil depth that makes the Central Park. Historically, this was a pretty rocky and swampy landscape, so that does make it challenging to get simple things like grass growing here in the park. One of the reasons we do pick specific types of grass for various areas. Although grass has a pretty shallow root growth and depth, um, having uh, rocky areas like this can still pose a challenge to even the hardiest grass species, uh, which is why our turf care team does an incredible job of selecting the proper species of grass and mixes for the proper areas of the park. As we look over North Meadow, we can see again a nice large expanse of green space that is shining bright and green even during this otherwise kind of colorless winter season. One of the main things that'll help combat uh, compaction of soil, as well as just help to inhibit better um, turf growth, is going to be a process called aeration. Aeration is something that some of you may be familiar with. Maybe you've seen an aerator before, or maybe you've seen an aerated lawn. Um, aerating is a really important process. We can again see the equipment, that vertidrain piece on the back being utilized here. 
Um, so the soil that is underneath grass does have a tendency to become very compacted, of course, from heavy foot traffic or even from machinery from time to time. And we can often see that soil leading again to a kind of preventative growth of different plants like grasses in there. The living material that actually exists between the grass and the soil is what's called, is what's known as thatch. That's a T-H-A-T-C-H. Um, it's typically up to about an inch or so in thickness and having a nice, really thick thatch is characteristic of a more healthy lawn. Um, but we can often see a thick thatch preventing airflow and water penetration, something that um, aerating will help with. By aerating or poking holes in the lawn, we can actually help to um, increase the nutrient uptake as well as improve drainage in these landscapes. Um, thatch aeration, which we can see occurring on um, down near Hector ball fields in this photo, um, allows different types of holes to be poked within the earth, bringing up these aerated pieces of soil back to the surface to again, not only allow drainage and to loosen up the soil, but also to allow those nutrients taken from the bottom to be kind of fertilized on top and allow for more nutrient um, nutrient dissolvement into the ground. Uh, we can again see the aeration here, which leads to a result like this. Now, this photo is not a bunch of goose excrement on the lawn, but again, an example of post aeration. You can aerate in various different ways, kind of sticking holes like with a rake into the yard or with like a pitchfork. However, the best way to do it is by actually churning up the soil and dirt from underneath the thatch. So again, this machine, getting that soil from underneath the thatch about two or three inches down, bringing it back up, allowing this soil and nutrient to kind of fertilize the top. Uh, this is a really helpful process. It is something that can be done much like raking and uh, cutting whenever the ground is not frozen, even if it's in the middle of the winter season. Um, doing this will prevent things like crown hydration from occurring. Uh, crown hydration is typically what happens when a uh, when we see um, we see grass taking up water on a warmer day and then ultimately allowing it to freeze over. Uh, something that becomes a real risk during our more mild winters as we get warmer days followed by freezing temperatures. So by doing a little bit of this, improving the drainage, we can actually prevent lawn from undergoing this crown hydration process, which will ultimately lead to dead spots, brown spots, and a very ugly lawn that requires a lot more work to bring back to life. Um, this is, of course, a very interesting process, one that you can notice all throughout the park. So if you ever see these little turned up dirt piles, you can know that that lawn has just been aerated. One of the most, one of the most important processes in caring for lawns. As we make, away, make our way a little bit further into the park, we can discuss just a few other ways in which our lawns are kept healthy and um, green. As we look over, we can notice another portion of North Meadow, this resting along the east side. Might even be able to see just a little bit of the east meadow poking out from the far right of this photo as well. But as we look over the lawns, we can see that, of course, some of the lawns, a lot of green spaces in the park during winter are closed for renovation. And renovation of lawns are, again, really important factors to include. And they're best done during winter when, of course, visitation to the park is at a minimal. And when lawns aren't necessarily that inviting, as they tend to be, of course, wet and sometimes covered with snow. But it's important to keep these lawns looking healthy. And we can notice a very big difference between the lawn that is currently undergoing restoration and the lawn just to the west, which, of course, already went through some restoration and has a beautiful lush green turf to it. Just by allowing a lot of lawns to be closed for the winter and rest for a few weeks, a few months, can really rejuvenate the lawn and bring back not only color, but a lot of loamy, fluffy, um, fluffy growth throughout it. Uh, what we can, of course, notice is, again, the tremendous amount of work that goes into keeping these lawns looking healthy. Uh, we talked a little bit about before how lawns really developed over in Europe, where the climate is more supportive of them. Here in North America, the temperate climate can be hard. And of course, warming temperatures and warming seasons means a lot more water use in caring for these lawns. We do see a tremendous amount of irrigation being applied to not only water the lawns, but also make sure they're kept, uh, kept well drained. 
and we can see our conservancy staff, primarily our turf care teams, really helping to go the extra mile to not only care for the physical health we want, but to support them for the activities we like. As we can see here, some of our staff painting soccer lines on the North Meadow Field, preparing it for the busy, busy recreational season that of course comes every spring, summer, and ends into the fall. We also see a lot of our um, turf care teams, those teams that are primarily focused on lawns throughout the park, helping to winterize the park come fall. Winterizing is simply the activity of really just turning off the irrigation systems. A lot of the water systems that otherwise would freeze and lead to significant damage or potentially even flooding in certain areas. Another thing to remember is really just the conditions that Central Park's lawns have been through and what they look like today. This picture from 1989 is a familiar sight for some people. It's what just about every lawn looked like in Central Park throughout really the late 20th century. Sheep Meadow, the Great Lawn, and areas of North Meadow really didn't retain their charming green grass, but rather featured dust bowls, compacted soil that again, uh, there's probably more dirt on this field than there is any green grass. Central Park lawns have undergone a huge change thanks to the not only volunteers that form the conservancy, but the specialized care and staff that we have today that cares for these various landscapes throughout the park. Of course, Great Lawn looks very different than it does today, and that's because of the immense amount of work that went into caring for these landscapes which ultimately would lead to some rules being applied. So although some of the rules might be annoying, like not having pets or cleats on the field, they're put in place to, of course, keep these lawns looking clean and green, so we never have to see them looking like dust bowls again. You also notice that certain activities are not allowed on here, um, including Quidditch. So sorry, Harry Potter fans, you cannot play Quidditch on the North Meadow area, but there are plenty of other little lawns that you can utilize for some of these simple recreation things. Sports. Up here, of course, you do need a permit to utilize the fields. Um, and you can, of course, apply for a permit through the New York City Parks Department uh, website. Very easy to obtain one and very inexpensive. But do apply for a permit so there's no scheduling conflicts when you come up here. Another important feature we can notice, something that's very simple, sewers and drains. Uh, sewers and drains are really important, and they were a very crucial part of early restoration of areas like Sheep Meadow, helping them to bring them back to life and, of course, make sure they stay clean and green. Drainage and irrigation are two of the most important things for lawns because, of course, you got to keep them watered when it's really hot and there's a lot of sun, and you got to make sure that water doesn't build up when there's heavy storms, heavy snowfall, and other precipitation. So drainage and sewage are maybe not the most pretty sights to see, but the most important to keep Central Park running. As we make our way just up the path a little bit, we can enjoy again some of the beautiful lush green of the west side of the North Meadow ball fields. And looking over this area again, considering all the hard work that goes into it, besides just watering, we do see a lot of seeding, sodding, and fertilizing occurring. Here is an example, of course, of seeding. And seeding can actually be done um, much like raking and lawn mowing, even in the winter season. Primarily with most of these activities, you just don't wanna do it when the ground is actually frozen over. But when the ground is thawed out and it's above freezing, ideally about 40 degrees or higher, seeding and sodding is something that can be done. Sodding looks a little something like this, and it actually, um, involves really just laying down physical grass. We can see machinery being used to cut up strips of grass, turf or sod here, cutting under that thatch that we talked about, and then allowing it to really just be placed, eventually rooting into its new location. Uh, really interesting to think that grass is kind of just like carpet. You can just rip it up and lay it down in various areas. Of course, a little bit more goes into it than just that. But thanks to our operation staff, primarily our turf care teams, we can see the park maintaining its beautiful, beautiful look year round. Another thing we can mention is something that we haven't had to really deal with that much this year, and that's really avoiding a lot of salt damage. Now, of course, we at the Conservancy do care for the park um, in really all aspects, including snow removal. Snow removal can be done with larger equipment, but is most often done with a lot of human force and human power, primarily snow plows and shovels and icebreakers. One thing you might notice is that many of the paths throughout the park 
um, they don't really receive a proper salting. And that's because a lot of different salts and chloride type products will actually leach into not only grasses, but also water bodies and really disrupt them. Uh, for grasses, it'll actually suck in a lot of these um, will suck in a lot of these different types of debris and cause something called um, physiological drought. And it's basically kind of like drinking salt water. It makes you feel like you're being hydrated, but it's actually dehydrating and damaging the grass. And we can see those salts and chlorides really playing a negative nasty role on many grasses throughout the park, which is why we often, of course, use a lot of human labor to shovel it out and sometimes lay down sand sand helping to provide a little bit of traction and grip, but not disrupting the quality of the lawns. And as we learned the other week in our sledding adventure through Central Park, sometimes we do see sand being put on meadows and areas to help fill in otherwise bumpy or uh, grooved areas. Sand will also help to kind of switch up the amount of organic matter in the soil and create a nice composition so the soil is a little bit more loamy. But as we look around and come to the northern end of North Meadow, we can remind ourselves that again, this is a human constructed landscape. And these types of lawns and turfs weren't as common over here in North America. The grasslands we find, similarly to those that can be found at the Dean Slope today, are quite different than the recreational lawns we see throughout the park like here. But as we walk around, we can remember again the immense amount of joy that these lawns bring us, providing us big pastoral views, areas to host countless different cultural gatherings, like this photo showing, showing Barbara Streisand's concert on Sheep Meadow back in 1967. Of course, plenty of other events occur on here, whether we're gathering on a lawn to in, be, engage in a huge cultural event or maybe just rest and relax like the sheep that once grazed upon sheep meadow did. Of course these lawns have taken on a multitude of different uses today and if it weren't for our incredibly talented operation staff like our turf team as well as the countless volunteers that help to volunteer their time and support these landscapes we would not have the same beautiful central park we have today. While a lawn again, might seem like something really similar, immense amount of cares, some uh, immense amount of care, sometimes even more so than an even more diverse landscape might. So thank you for joining us a little bit today and learning a little bit about the winter tree care, or rather the winter lawn care that we provide lawns here in Central Park. This is the little route that we've taken today as we've wrapped around North Meadow, a great landscape to visit, whether you just want to maybe picnic around or engage in some recreation. But as you do explore the park, continue exploring new landscapes and learning about new different types of information. Since we are in March, we are celebrating Women's History Month now, and we're bringing back our hidden highlights Women in Central Park, or rather Hidden History, Women in Central Park tour. You can find it at these following dates. It is a really amazing tour that'll show you a lot more than just the new women's uh, suffragette monument, the Women's Pioneers Rights Monument, rather, but a lot of amazing information included there. So be on the lookout for these tours, which you can find here, as well as check the chat for the links to find uh, information on these tours that my colleagues will share. But of course, a lot of ways to learn about the park Check out some of those links for not only future tours, but also to learn a little bit about the support we give to parks beyond just Central Park. But once again, I will leave this open for a little bit longer in case there's any questions we didn't have time to answer. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, from everybody here at the Central Park Conservancy, stay safe, be well, and we'll see you soon. Take care, everybody.